computer now. So, uh, so I wanted to uh, welcome everyone to the uh, May 3rd meeting of the Mono Basin Historical Society. And I hope you're enjoying these monthly presentations. If you are already a member of the MBHS, we thank you for your support. And if you're not already a member, we hope that you consider becoming a member and supporting the Mono Basin Historical Society. You can um, join by going on our website, monobasinhistory.org. And we're just gonna go over a few announcements before we start tonight's program. Um, the first one is that our, um, the Adopt a Highway cleanup went really well. Um, that was on Earth Day, April 22nd. And let me see, I think I've got a photo here. And it looks like quite a group was out there uh, and they picked up quite a bit of trash. So uh, thank you for everyone uh, that participated. Now let's see, uh, we'll stop that. And um, I wanted to thank everyone who contributed to the supplies to stabilize the Philocena house. We now have the funds to um, buy the materials to stabilize the house. And our trustee chair chairman, Dave Swisher, will be out at the site on Friday afternoon. If you are interested in helping with this project, please contact Dave and I'll put his uh, phone number in the chat. So if anyone is interested, it will be there. And hopefully next month we'll have some photos to show that uh, will show the, uh, the house stabilized. So the other is we have some upcoming events. With COVID restrictions lifting somewhat, we have decided to move forward with two of our events that we had to cancel last year the ghost tour and the art and ice cream. So art and ice cream is scheduled for July 17th and uh, Priscilla Hawkins is organizing the event. And we're gonna go ahead and uh, let Priscilla uh, give some updates on that. So Priscilla, gotta unmute. Yes, hello. Go. Good evening, I'm very excited to tell you that we are going to have our event fundraiser, Artists and Ice Cream, this year. This is a very artistic event, and you can imagine that's why I love it. Anything artistic. So let's look at this flyer um, that I think you see on the screen. We'll just read it over here quickly. Artists and Ice Cream fundraiser. This flyer is a call for artists with Eastern Sierra related handmade artwork, that is paintings, pottery, beadwork, photography, and other, to display and sell your work at an event, Artists and Ice Cream, July 17th, 2021, Saturday from 10 till four, outdoors at the Solar Pavilion area and Hess Park in Levining. Now the cost per artist is $25, and these artists, if they sell anything, they do not need to give us any percentage of it. So this is, this is quite a good deal for an event like this for artists. Um, uh, so we're asking them just to submit a photo of their work to this address here so we can see what it is they do. It's gonna be a fundraiser for the Mono Basin Historical Society and the Community Presbyterian Church. And the questions, there's my name and telephone number. And um, I would love to have you give me a call because we are going to definitely need volunteers. I have a committee of two other people that will be working hard on this, but we'll need help in lots of different areas. Um, the biggest thing right now that I would ask you if you can help us with is think of an artist who you know who might be interested in um, putting up a table and we can help with some of that um, equipment too um, for this event. It's just a one day thing and I know there's a lot of artists around. So if you can get this flyer to one of these people and, and they can call me or, or email, that would be a great help. We're also gonna have live musicians playing as you stroll around from one artist's work to the next. Um, and my plan is to not use any throwaway cups or bowls at this event. This, the county at this point has told us that we can have up to 50 people outside. 
So that should probably work just great. And that's pretty much my report. We'll be having another flyer come out to advertise the, uh, the exact event. But um, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla. And, uh, and now we've got the ghost tour planned for August 27th and 28th. And uh, Dave Carl is coordinating that. So Dave, can you, you wanna give us some info? Sure. Um, so the annual Ghost of the Sagebrush Tour um, is this will be, since we had to skip last year, this is gonna be the 17th annual. And the theme is Rediscovering Lower Rush Creek History and Remembrances. And some of you, um, if you've been involved with this for a long time, you know that we put together a calendar last year um, that with had pictures that are related to this topic. Um, I want to just mention that we will be getting, we've, we've already lined up a number of speakers on these various topics that have to do with Lower Rush Creek. Um, but I, um, I noticed when I was looking at my calendar today for August, the dates are August 27th and 28th, that and Saturday tour, on the calendar, we, we put it in as, um, you know, doing this a year ahead of time on the, a week earlier than that. So it's written in there. And I want you now to go to your August calendar and circle it and put an arrow down to a week later um, so that, it, that uh, you don't get confused. But tickets will become available. And the way we're going to do it because of the COVID situation is set up a, a kind of a reservation system. Don't won't take any money until we're absolutely sure that we really can pull this off with the with that situation. And um, what am I forgetting? Anything else, Robin? Uh, let's see. We've got um, the new owners of the Mono Inn, uh, oh, yes. Hillary Hansen Jones. She has agreed to host the dinner for us. So we've been having the dinner at uh, at the Mono Inn, and we will continue to have it there. And it'll be on their outside. Um, you know, um, we don't have to be crammed into the inside and close to each other. As far as that concern goes, we have the outside grounds. And um, we'll, we'll have a program as always as part of that night, Friday night, uh, um, you know, event. Okay. And so more info to come. Yeah. And as soon as we have more, we're, we'll be posting it on our website. So that's really all of our um, announcements for this evening. And at the end of today, tonight's program, we'll talk about next month's. But uh, for tonight, I'm really pleased to introduce Dave Woodruff. And in case you don't know, let's see if we can see this. Oh, my lighting is horrible. Uh, Dave has written the books, um, Tales Along the El Camino. There we go. Tales Along the El Camino Sierra. And there's actually three of them out, uh, one, two, and three. And uh, if you are interested in any of those books, they are available at the MBHS online store. And tonight's presentation, uh, Dave is going to talk to us about the Watterson brothers. Are they villains or victims? So take it away, Dave. Sure, okay. Oops, okay. So, am I there, Richard? Yes, we see and it's very clear. Whoops, okay. we're back to MonoBasinHistoricalSociety.org. Great. Well, Robin, thank you very much for having me here tonight. I am honored to once again be able to be part of the Mono Basin Historical Society's uh, programs that they offer to people. Uh, for those of you that aren't members already, I'm going to start with an advertisement and piggyback on Robin. Please consider joining the Mono Basin Historical Society. These organizations in these small towns, they are so vital and so important when it comes to preserving and archiving and keeping our local and regional history relevant. And you probably won't find a better small museum and historical society than the one there in Levining for the Mono Basin. So you can go to www.monobasinhistory.org and you can join today. So thank you all for your support. Those of you that are already members, thank you very much for that. So tonight's program is indeed the Watterson brothers, villains or victims. I'm going to assume most of you 
that are interested in Eastern Sierra history are at least a little bit familiar with who these folks are. But I hope that after I make a presentation tonight that I can enlighten all of you a little bit more into just who these people are and the complexities that are involved in the Eastern Sierras and uh, the importance that they played in many roles here, including the water situation here in the Eastern Sierra as well. So, the world, it's a big and sometimes complex and often very confusing place. Oftentimes, our humans kind's best intentions, they don't always yield the positive results that we hope for. Most of us learn at an early age, usually from our parents, to discern and, and understand the difference between right and wrong. But sometimes, uh, that distinction might not be so readily apparent. And occasionally, the difference is just not very clear at all. I like this quote. I personally figured out for myself a long time ago that most people on the planet, they're inherently good and decent, and that all of us are at the same time human, and therefore prone to make mistakes. And from time to time, we all make some bad choices. Sometimes the mistakes we make can have some rather significant consequences. And ultimately, it's how we feel inside about our actions that determine whether or not we think we did the right or wrong thing. I like this quote from Ernest Hemingway. I know only that what is moral is what you feel good after, and what is immoral is what you feel bad after. So the Watterson Brothers, the program tonight, not only takes an historical look at two of the most influential people to have ever called the Eastern Sierra home in modern times, but it also explores the many considerations of what we think and what we feel about what is right and what is wrong. So William Watterson, he was the father of Mark and Wilfred Watterson, the two brothers. William's father, James, along with lots of other Watterson relatives, they came from the Isle of Man. Um, is, is the side of the slide visible, Richard, over there? Or do I need to? It, it seems quite clear to me. Okay, I, was, I see the little icons, and I wasn't sure if those are they're covering up my part. But on the right there, the Isle of Man, if you can see that, it's between Ireland and the mainland where England is at. And several of the Watersons, including... Uh, William, the father of uh, Mark and uh, Wilfred, immigrated to the United States starting in the 1860s. Some of them went to Virginia City. Others made their way all the way to the Central Valley, trying to find a new life in America. So uh, William settled in Stockton. They got involved in agriculture, and they were pretty successful, but they heard that things were going pretty good on the east side of the mountains, that there was a lot of fertile land there that was reasonably priced and that there was a relatively high demand, at least on a, on a local scale, for agricultural products to be grown in that area. So William decided he would give it a try and move the family over to the east side of the Sierras. He got his oldest son, Wilfred, who was 16 years old at the time, to herd a big band of sheep that they had raised in the Central Valley up and over the Sierras and onto the other side where he figured he could sell them in the market for both food and for the wool that they would produce. This was in 1877. Uh, there was the two brothers and the three sisters that they had. So William Watterson had a pretty good life. They settled in, in and near Benton. Uh, the area was doing quite well with the growing of agriculture because there was a pretty high demand from it from the many uh, mining camps that were going on at that time in Eastern California and in Western Nevada. Um, it became a quite excellent market, especially with the wonderful town of Bodie, which at times had up to 10,000 people, according to some historians. So the Watterson Branch provided food and supplies to the nearby mining camps, including all the way over to Candelaria and on beyond as well. So Wilfred, who worked real hard along with his brother Mark on their father's ranch there in the 
uh, Hamill Valley near Benton. Uh, he worked real hard, and in 1896, he married his sweetheart, Catherine Matlack, which was also from another pioneer family there in the Eastern Sierras. And at that same time, Wilfred decided he was going to go into business. He saw how successful his father had been, and he had dreams of attaining his own level of, uh, of success as well. But he wanted to get involved in the merchant business. So along with a gentleman named um, W, I'm sorry, T.E. Lease, they started Bishop Hardware the same year he got married in 1896. They provided not only hardware, but supplies throughout that northern end of the Owens Valley. So as more and more farmers came to the Owens Valley and started to grow their crops and take advantage of the mining camps around selling their agricultural products, uh, there was more and more agricultural products available. And now it became a little bit of a problem to find additional markets beyond the local mining camps. After all, transportation costs to get your goods to market were going to be pretty expensive if you were going to get them out of the Owens Valley in your Mono County areas. So Wilfred um, decided he would help the farmers out and he would take grain as credit for payment for the many supplies that he provided. So he in turn would turn around and sell that grain to far off market. So he ended up becoming not just the owner of the hardware store, but as a middleman for the agricultural products that were grown in the Northern, well, most of the Owens Valley during that time. He took on the route of a wholesaler, the local farmers, and he even encouraged them to maybe raise crops that were a little bit easier to transport, like turkeys as well. So his partner, T.E. Lease, passed away shortly after they started the business. So Wilfred invited his brother Mark to join him as one of his partners. So their hardware business did pretty good because of their accommodating way that they dealt with all of their neighbors and other ranchers and farmers there in the Owens Valley. Uh, one of the things they were most proud about in 1904, they received a letter from the Studebaker Wagon Company. They were involved in wagon making before they got involved in automobiles later. And they congratulated the Watterson brothers because their little store there in Bishop sold more Studebaker wagons than any other retailer west of the Rocky Mountains. So that's saying something how successful that their business was. Wilfred also brought one of the first automobiles to the Eastern Sierra. He could see quite readily how useful the horseless carriage was going to be in such a remote area. He got himself a white steamer and brought it here. Just as a side note, I'm not much of a car aficionado, especially a vintage car, but the, the white steamer was actually made at the time by the same company that made white sewing machines. I guess a lot of different companies got into the new automobile market back when they started to become around in the first century, first decade of the 20th century. The Watterson brothers also realized the importance of cars would play in helping to bring tourists to this magical area we call the Eastern Sierras. They were founding members, one of two of 64 of the Inyo Good Road Club. And any of you that have seen any of my programs in the past about El Camino Sierra, you already know that the Inyo Good Road Club played a very important role in bringing good roads to the Eastern Sierra. Good roads meant people would drive them and come here and visit and be tourists and help support the economy in that way as well. So from the very start, Mark and Wilfred were members of the Inyo Good Road Club helping to promote the Eastern Sierras. I just put this picture in just because it's one of my favorites. Uh, there, the guy in the trench coat and the long uh, driving coat is Wilfred, is uh, W.G. Scott. He was the corresponding secretary, but effectively he was the mover and shaker behind the whole Inyo Good Road Club. I just like this picture as he's out there lobbying on behalf of us here in the Eastern Sierras. So as the hardware business grew, so did Watterson Incorporated. They branched out and started to become involved 
in a number of different business ventures. In 1905, they bought property in the White Mountains, up where the bristlecone pine and the limber pine are at. It appears that they were going to try to do some kind of forestry and logging business, providing lumber for down in the Owens Valley. In 1907, they reached as far away as the Ubihibi lead and silver mine in Death Valley. If you've ever been to the racetrack playa there, uh, that's where the vicinity of this mine was at. So that was a pretty long ways away in 1907, but they invested and got involved in developing that. They also started their own garage, and I like this as well. They called it the what? They called it the El Camino Sierra Garage, without being out there to repair some of those newfangled horseless carriages that were arriving in the Owens Valley back around 1908, 1909. Their garage business became so successful and more and more people were interested in getting their own automobile that they soon brought in a Ford and Lincoln dealership that they also had to house their garage in as well. They were one of the first new car dealers in the entire Eastern Sierra. So they were moving along pretty good, being pretty gosh darn successful. They also invested in some tungsten mining, a deposit on the northwest slope of Mount Tom up Pine Creek Canyon there. And they got involved in agriculture themselves, both in the Round Valley and out near their father's original place there, out in the Hamill Valley as well. But probably the biggest project that they ever got in was all the way down in Keeler on the shores of Owens Lake. They got something they called the Natural Soda Product, NSP, that they developed down there. It effectively harvested some of the minerals on, Mona, on the Owens Lake that they made sodium bicarbonate out of. It was, as you can see in this picture, a pretty sizable operation and employed well over 100 people at its peak. Every week they would harvest several dozen railroad cars of, of the sodium bicarbonate and send it off. It was used a lot in soap products in that day, but indeed it was a very, very successful operation. I, I put this picture in there because when the Bodie Railway went down, one of the little, this isn't it, but one of the little rail cars went down there and, and worked for a while down uh, for the NSP company down there in the shores of uh, Owens Lake hauling around the sodium bicarbonate. So a very successful operation, a very big employer that they had down there in Keeler. And I love this part. They also bought Coso Hot Springs down there now on the China Lake Naval uh, Station down there a little bit north of Ridgecrest. Uh, they not only ran the resort, but if you can see on the right hand side, they actually uh, bottled some of the water and sold it off there as well. I love this. If you can read it on your screens, on the top there, it says um, sediments of medicinal value. And then I look, I love it down farther. You look and it see, it says, make the, uh, the volcanoes are erupting down there in both parts. And uh, yeah, pretty, pretty dramatic advertising that they had to push their bottled water along with the resort that they had down there at Coso. So customers, in the Owens Valley back around the first decade of the 20th century. They not only relied on the Watterson brothers to help them sell their grains to other markets and to provide a, a means to get it there as well and arranging transportation by freight and by railroad farther to the south. People would also come in and cash their checks there at the Watterson hardware store because they did a high volume of business and they were able to take care of that. In the turn of the, uh, between uh, 1900, there was no banks going on yet there. So people would come in and cash their checks and they started to say, hey, brothers, we see you have a pretty big vault there in the back of the hardware store. I have a lot of cash that I like to keep around and I don't feel safe keeping it at my farmhouse. I wonder if you might be able to keep some of my money safe in your banks. The people highly respected the Watterson brothers. They were community and civic leaders and financial leaders of the highest regard. So people started asking them if they would keep their money there safe in their bank for them. Well, <laughs> The Bodders and brothers started to figure out, well, if people need a place to cash their checks and to store their money, maybe we should consider getting involved in the bank business. 
1902, the Watterson brothers did just that. Uh, they're on Academy and uh, Academy and Main Street in downtown Bishop. They got a charter from the state and they opened the first of what ended up being four branches of the Inyo County Bank. I'm going to read a little bit of the newspaper article that appeared in the register here. I like this. The Inyo County Bank will open its doors for business next Monday. Its quarters at the corner of Main Street and Academy Avenue are well fitted in regulation style with a fine fire and burglar proof safe and all other accessories needed. So the bank came and boy, now they were off arranging for loans, storing people's money, cashing checks. It seemed like there was nobody more important financially and civically in the entire Eastern Sierras at the time than Wilfred and Mark Watterson. They indeed became the financial and community leaders in the Owens Valley, and they were admired and respected by everyone. The two brothers are there on the left, and there in the middle again is my good friend W.G. Scott from the Inyo Good Road Club, and a pretty big size mover and shaker in Inyo County at the time as well. His other job was a mining engineer on top of promoting with the Inyo Good Road Club. So things prospered pretty well. Business in the Eastern Sierra and the Owens Valley grew rather steadily that first decade of the 20th century. Um, in fact, the first two decades of the 20th century, thanks primarily to both agriculture and mining. Those were the two big dynamos that powered the economy here. But all that was about to start changing rather slowly at first. In 1913, of course, the LA Aqueduct was opened and completed and it began delivering water from the eastern sierras of course down to southern california so no sooner did los angeles and southern california get the water then what happened more people started moving there than ever before uh, in the 10 years between 1910 and 1920 the population of the city of la almost doubled it went from 319,000 to 500 and 77,000, truly a, a staggering number of people because now they could provide the water for them. But as they say, timing is everything. And in the early 1920s, a drought fell upon the state of California and a pretty severe one at that. Between the drought and the huge increase in population, so no sooner had the LA Aqueduct been completed and started shipping Owens River water south, but all of a sudden, there wasn't enough water anymore. When the aqueduct first opened, most of the water that was put in it was coming from the Independence and Lone Pine and even a little bit further south areas. When uh, that, that first seven, eight, nine years of the aqueduct, not much water came from Big Pine and uh, Bishop. They were still relatively untouched. LA made the purchases down around Manzanar and other places. So that's where the water came from, but now the city needed more. Here's a nice shot of the intake down there at Aberdeen, where the river goes from being a river and it's diverted into the canal if you've never been down there before. So most of the farmlands in the Owens Valley and the Big Pine and Bishop areas, they were still in private hands in the early 1920s. There were several ditch companies. You all know what, quite well that there's not enough moisture falling naturally out of the sky on the Eastern Sierra to provide year-round farming. So of course, irrigation was an important part of it. And there were irrigation ditches were vital and they were located all over the Big Pine and Bishop areas. Uh, as the city came north, they decided to start trying to buy property for those that would sell it. Uh, you know, they would offer higher than market values, and some people took it up on them in the Bishop and Big Pine areas, but most people weren't that interested. They were pretty happy with the agricultural life that they were providing, and they wanted to stay that way. But the city, they indeed needed that water, so they started to make plans for other ways that they could go about doing it. One of the th first things they did in 1923, they bought what was called the McNally Ditch. It was not only one of the largest of the ditch companies in the Northern Owens Valley, but it was also the oldest. They held 
enormous water rights. And there were some people on the board of the ditch, like their uncle George Watterson, the Simons and others that held on to it that were sympathetic to LA and also willing to take their money. So they sold the McNally ditch and that started to change the complexity of what the people that didn't want to sell out could do. Once LA controlled that much of the water, a lot of pressure started to fall upon the other people that were held on there. Um, so LA agents began purchasing, oh, let me go back here, sorry. Began purchasing a few ranches and farms in the northern end of the valley. And to, uh, as the farmers saw what was happening at the McNally Ditch, the Watterson brothers, and especially under the leadership of Wilfred, thought that the separate irrigation ditches should band together. By banding together and forming something that they called an irrigation district, they would have a unified voice in, against LA. If LA came with money and wanted to buy more land and more water rights, operating as an entire district that represented all the remaining ditches, they felt they would have a much more powerful and much more effective voice. So they convinced the rest of the ditches to form indeed what they called the Owens Valley Irrigation District to be able to uh, negotiate properly or withstand some of the tactics of Los Angeles in their attempts to acquire the water. So here's a map of in 1925 of the Northern Owens Valley. Let me see if I can get the mouse to move around here a little bit. So the gray area here, this is the area that the city owned from the very beginning when they started to come up and started purchasing lands when they were going to build the aqueduct in 1907, 1908, 1909. This was their land. When the drought fell upon the state and they thought they needed more water, the black represents the land that they purchased in 1923 and 1925. The McNally Ditch is represented mostly here on the east side of the Owens River from Laws heading on down farther south. But there's these other parcels of lands that you can see that they acquired. Some people called it a checkerboard pattern. When they would buy this piece of property here, it forced the other farmers that were left here in the white shaded areas to have to now do more work in taking care of those irrigation ditches along the way. It made it much more difficult for these other people that were trying to hold out to stay there. Um, there was a quote from Willie Chalfont, who was the editor of the Inyo Register at the time, and one of the more vocal opponents to LA coming up and literally taking over the entire Inyo County at that time. So here's a quote from a newspaper article from Chalfont. It says, every trick and device and misrepresentation of was used in the campaign to buy by, of LA to buy irrigated land. A city representative boasted to me in my office that he knew the financial status of every landowner, if mortgage, what his mortgage was due, and other facts. So Chalfont claims that the city came up and had a real strategic interest in trying to force out these remaining farmers by buying up the big McNally ditch and then doing a checkerboard pattern of purchases on anyone else that would hold out from it. So the Owens Valley Irrigation Ditch was formed, or uh, Irrigation District was formed to try and fight off some of LA's attempts. About that same time in 1923, the city started drilling wells on land that they did own. And of course, everyone knows what's happened when you drill large wells and start pumping large amounts of water, the water table in the nearby property started to drop. So that also did not sit well with farmers that were trying to hold on and irrigate their own lands with what water that happened to be left. The situation 1923 and 1924, it started to grow very dire. As some people sold out and moved away with the money that they had, the people that were left were feeling under enormous pressures to do so. Articles like this started to appear in the paper. Greed of the city ruins the Owens Valley. Down here at the bottom, you can see the picture of a woman with her four children, and it says, high price, talk is false, and no evidence appears for statement to the contrary. This is an article about a woman whose husband, who was a rancher there, just north of Big Pine, committed suicide. He just couldn't take it any longer. He felt he was under so much pressure to 
hold out against the city of Los Angeles as it came along trying to gobble up most of that water. And the Watersons led the resistance. Not only was Wilfred the president of the Owens Valley uh, Irrigation District, but they would, in whatever negotiations were able to take place, it was generally Wilfred and often with Mark's assistance, along with a few other civic leaders, that would try to do the negotiating with the city. So here's a picture of the inside of their Bishop Inyo County Bank. Um, Wilfred and Mark sit on the side there. And they used to brag about how they ran their bank. It was now open for about 22 years. And they would brag that they never once foreclosed on a mortgage or a loan of any of the customers that they had. Their influence continued to grow, especially when it came to the area's resistance to the city of LA, literally take no prisoners approach to obtaining Owens Valley water and the land that went with it. So finally, frustrated by several attempts by business leaders and politicians in the Owens Valley and Sacramento to settle on some kind of an agreement with the city as far as a fair and equitable negotiation, for the land that was left because by now people were starting to think we'll sell out we just want to make sure we get enough money for our land they saw that the writing was on the wall and the city was probably not going to give up under any circumstances so they felt if they could negotiate as a whole they would be able to get the best price but the city wasn't going to have any of it and so on march i'm sorry on may 21st 1924 11 cars in the early morning drove down from Bishop. They were reported to have taken their license plates off and drive through Big Pine with their lights off. They made their way past Independence and Lone Pine and a few miles south of Lone Pine where the aqueduct has gone from a dirt canal to a, a cement canal. The people that were in these 11 cars, they got out, walked over to the uh, concrete line ditch. They did a little bit of work. And in the early morning hours of that day, a huge and tremendous explosion happened. That took out a little bit of the aqueduct there. It didn't really disrupt the water flow entirely, but it certainly did get the city's attention, but not to much effectiveness as far as any kind of negotiation. The city of LA said that we don't recognize the irrigation district and we will not negotiate with them. The city sent detectives up to take a look at the ex first explosion there that happened on the aqueduct. The detective said, oh, there was some evidence that perhaps the dynamite had come from the Watterson Brothers hardware store, but there was no conclusive proof that the Watersons were involved in it in any way. People undoubtedly knew the Watterson Brothers led the resistance movement, but there was no evidence to the contrary that they were anyhow involved in the explosion and the dye mining of the aqueduct down there. It was well known that they were leaders in the community against it, but like I said, there was no proof. So LA's resistance in negotiating with the Owens Valley farmers and business owners collectively proved to perhaps be the major stumbling block between the two parties. So Chalfont again, and I quote in another article, every effort was made by Owens Valley people during these trying years to have Los Angeles announce a definite program, whatever it might be, so that the future might be planned. The lack of such an, the lack of such an understanding was the most injurious fact of the whole controversy." End quote. The Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, as they were noticing that the people in the Owens Valley were pretty upset about what was going on, well, they sent, so their representatives up to the Owens Valley to talk to the people up there to find out what was their grievances exactly. So they met with Wilfred Watterson and others to learn of what was wrong and what would make them happy. Well, the Owens Valley folks gave them quite an earful and the chamber went back. They prepared a report urging the city to negotiate fairly and to pay certainly far above market prices for the remaining land and water rights, but as the city of Los Angeles did with many of these water issues at that time, they ignored the report. In fact, they were able to even to put enough pressure 
on the city on the chamber to not even publish it at that time. So from the start, there were a lot of people in the Owens Valley that felt the city, because there had been talk about it from the start, meaning 1905, that they should build, they the city, a dam in the upper Owens River drainage, way up high north of Bishop, and where Crowley Lake now sits today. They felt if a dam was built there and a reservoir impounded behind it, that the water there would be more than enough to keep the aqueduct full and provide enough water for the people that wanted to remain in the Bishop and Big Pine areas to still stay involved in irrigated farming and ranching. And the city, like I said, well, they had plans to do so as well, but they were gonna need to have the land that was behind where they were gonna build the dam there at the very upper end of the Owens River Gorge to impound the reservoir behind. Well, it just so happened, most of that land there in Long Valley, or at least a sizable portion of it, was owned by Fred Eaton. Very quickly, Fred Eaton was the mayor of Los Angeles in 1898 to 1900, the superintendent of their water department before William Mulholland became the superintendent, and the biggest proponent of building the LA Aqueduct. A lot of people think it was Mulholland. Well, Mulholland thought it was a great idea. He designed it and had it built, but it was not his original idea to do so. It was Fred Eaton. Eaton also bought most of the original land down in the Independence and Lone Pine areas. He bought it from the ranchers and farmers down there and turned around and sold it to the city of LA for a relatively small commission. However, he kept the Long Valley property that he bought as his ace in the hole. He figured that was going to be his retirement property. He knew that the city someday would probably want to build the dam there and he would sell him at them his Long Valley property to do so, to be able to inundate it with a reservoir. He wanted a million dollars for it. And Mulholland, who had been friends with Eaton, thought Eaton was doing nothing but trying to rip off the city and he offered him $300,000. He later offered him $500,000, but Eaton was steadfast and refused to sell out. So the city said, okay, we'll build a dam up there, but instead of building it about 150 feet tall, which would have put a reservoir that had pounded all the way back to the upper reaches of Crowley, where Crowley Lake is today, they'd build a 100 foot dam, a lot smaller, and it would only inundate a little bit of land that they already controlled there at the, at the southern end of Long Valley. The people in the Owens Valley, when they found out that the city was only going to build a 100 foot dam and therefore not impound much water, they actually sued the city to build a bigger dam. Well, the city started the foundations and they started the plans only to do a 100 foot dam, but once the water situation in the 23, 24, 25 got going, things got put on hold for a while, even though their own engineers said that the 150 foot dam was indeed the way to go. As I mentioned earlier, the water board from the city of Los Angeles said they're not gonna recognize the irrigation district for negotiation. That happened in October of 1924. And about a month later, again, in the early darkness of night, this time about 50 cars, made their way down south from Bishop through Big Pine and Independence. This time they stopped at an area called the Alabama Gates. I'm sure almost all of you are well familiar with those. This is a place where a great big diversion of concrete gates were built to be able to divert water out of the aqueduct back down into the Owens Valley should that need ever arise. They, uh, the 50 or so cars and 100 or so men climbed out, they marched up to the Alabama gates, they told the night watchman that his services were no longer needed, the night watchman left, they cut the locks on the gates, they turned them so that the valves opened up, and of course the water flowed not down the aqueduct towards LA, but it flowed down back down into the Owens Valley and eventually into the Owens River. I love this picture there in the lower right of the LA aqueduct obviously being empty. It was quite a publicity stunt, if you will. Over the next few days, several hundred people showed up. The, the, the situation became rather festive. They had 
huge barbecues. Mark Watterson was the leader along with uh, uh, Mr. Keogh, the originator of Keogh Hot Springs down there. They were the actual uh, leaders at the point there at the Alabama gates. And Mark had already made his way discreetly down to the city of Los Angeles when the uh, gates were overtaken to be able to be down there to negotiate. They tried to get the governor involved and everything else to send state troopers down there, something which he never did. But it did indeed gain a lot of publicity throughout the state with their uh, capturing of the gates and turning the water back in. Philip Keogh, along with Mark Watterson, directed it. Meanwhile, Wilfred down in Los Angeles, he met with something called the Los Angeles Clearinghouse. It was just an assortment of banks that were there, again, being tired of trying to negotiate with the city, the Watersons and other community activists down there tried any other avenue to try and get pressure put on Los Angeles to negotiate what they felt was fairly and honorably down there. So Wilfred met with these bankers. The bankers made a promise to, the, uh, to uh, try and come up with a solution that would be equitable and fair to the Owens Valley residents on behalf of the city of Los Angeles. Well, they made the resolution to do it, but nothing, of course, <laughs> ended up ever being done. From 1924 to 1927, there were at least 11 more bombings of the aqueduct as frustrated people in the Owens Valley would do anything they could to try and get the attention of Los Angeles to negotiate fairly. But as we all pretty much know of interest here in the Eastern Sierras, the city held steadfast. They did what they felt was right for their water department and their city, offering to buy land that those would sell it at a price that they wanted to set and uh, keep trying to put pressure on those that remain as well. So it was a pretty difficult time. Wilfred and Mark led this resistance as far as politically and civically. They made numerous trips to Sacramento representing the interests back in the Owens Valley. And they were indeed considered the leaders of the resistance in the Owens Valley to the Los Angeles city trying to take the rest of, this, of the Owens Valley water. But in August of 1927, after four years of frustration and going on, auditors appeared on the doorsteps of the Inyo County Bank there in Bishop. Uh, aud auditors and examiners, they were sent by the California State Banking Committee to do a surprise audit, audit on the uh, Watterson Brothers Banks. The very next day, August 4th, 1927, the article appeared in the paper that the, all the Watterson Banks had closed the doors. Just the day after that the auditors showed up, the Watterson Brothers themselves decided they better close the banks and the state took them over. Um, all four of their branches, Lone Pine, Independence, Big Pine, and Bishop, and they also owned another bank called the Owens Valley Bank in Bishop as well. So the five banks, they closed their doors and this note was put on the doors. And it says, we find it necessary to close our banks in the Owens Valley. This result has been brought about by the past four years of destructive work carried on by the city of Los Angeles. Wilfred Watterson, president, Mark Watterson, cashier. So there's different versions as to what brought on suspicions by the state to come and do their surprise audit. One account was that on August 2nd, 1927, clerks in Sacramento at the state superintendent of banks office, that they noticed looking over all their various reports that the Inyo County Bank reported that they had a credit of $190,000 with the Wells Fargo Bank of San Francisco. But looking at the Wells Fargo Bank of San Francisco's records, it showed that they only had an $11,000 deposit from the Watterson Banks in Inyo County. So that was one account what set the auditors off. But there's another account by Remy Nadeau, who in his, in his book on the water wars of the Owens Valley, and that was that LA's official representative in the Owens Valley, a lawyer by the name of Ed Leahy, he represented LA's interests, did a lot of their negotiating for them as well, that he, 
think in, try, in the attempt to seek out an advantage in his struggle with the Watterson bankers, he was able to secure a financial statement of their outside businesses, which was called Watterson's Incorporated. And on those, he noticed, or thought he noticed, a number of unspecified money disbursements, primarily to a gentleman named Harry Glasscock. Harry Glasscock was a firebrand of a newspaper editor who owned the Owens Valley Herald. I quoted Willie Chalfont earlier, but compared to um, Glasscock, uh, Chalfont was a pacifist. Uh, uh, Harry Glasscock would write stories about blood would flow and the city would pay a price that they would never forget. And he really urged, or at least many people did, even subtly, a violence against the city in its many attempts. So he, Leahy claims that he saw that the Watersons had paid Glasscock several disbursements of money. And he thought that that meant that Glasscock was somehow involved in some of the destructive work at the aqueduct. So he supposedly, Leahy, told the bank commissioner in Sacramento, we have reason to believe, Leahy reported solemnly, that corporate funds are being used for dynamiting the aqueduct. The startled commissioner looked at them in amazement. Would you repeat that? Leahy made the charge again and added details on the conditions of the Watterson finances. I suggest you send an examiner over there to look at the situation in those banks. And supposedly that night, at the request of the bank commissioner, William Woods, uh, they sent investigators that boarded the train for the Owens Valley and the next morning they arrived. And uh, that was when the audit started and the rest is like we said, history. Uh, when, when the dispatchers, when the bank examiners showed up, the, uh, the brothers, they closed the banks and they readily admitted that indeed there was these many shortages that were found. Let's see. So in August, so they, at first, Wilfred asked the bank examiners, they readily admitted of the shortages and they told them that the reason that they were so short was they took all this money to prop up their own businesses, which employed many people in the Owens Valley. As the economy was struggling, they thought they needed to do all they could to keep the financial health of the county going. So they said they took the money to keep their own businesses afloat like I said, to keep the economy going. They said every dime of it stayed here in the Owens Valley and none of it went for their own personal use. They said that they would be able to maybe get loans from Los Angeles banks. The bank commissioner actually let Wilfred board the train for Los Angeles to go down and see if he could secure loans from LA banks to cover the shortages in his bank. The shortages were estimated eventually to be anywhere from between $400,000 to about $2.2 .2 million. The shortages were not always just in bank funds. They also owned a lot of corporate bonds, including that for the Owens Valley Irrigation District, that all of that money was missing, according to the bank examiners. Well, Wilfred came back and the banks would not, in LA, would not give them the loans to pay the money back. Up to $600,000 was pledged by people in the Owens Valley to cover the loans and the losses and the shortages, but that wasn't going to be enough to cover what the, what the state said was the total amount that was missing in the banks. So on August 13th, about a little bit more than 10 days after, I'm sorry, nine days after the banks were closed, the state and the district attorney in Inyo County they arrested the brothers and they charged them with 36 felony counts. Friends and supporters, they immediately posted the $25,000 bonds. And over the next couple of weeks, the Watersons made appearances throughout the Owens Valley telling people, I quote, look back over our past records and judge by that and not by the present crisis, which you all well know has been brought on and aggravated by over five years of intense and unjust warfare that still continues. The present condition has not been brought about by dishonesty or incompetency. Our past records of over 41 years of fair and honorable dealing with you should not, in justice to ourselves 
and us be forgotten. Wow. For the most part, though stunned, almost everyone in the Eastern Sierras continued to support the brothers and felt there was no way that Wilfred and Mark would have betrayed them or would have done anything wrong on the scope that they were being charged with. I like this letter. This is from Jess Hessian. He is the Inyo County District Attorney and a member of a pioneer, another pioneer family there in Inyo County. About five months before all the fiasco broke out in August of 1927, in March of that same year, he wrote this letter to the same state banking commissioner in Sacramento. At that time, another group of people were trying to start another bank in the Owens Valley. And the Watterson brothers, of course, didn't want another bank. The economy was so bad and banking business was so poor that they just felt more competition would be a very bad thing. So Hessian, before all this happened with the bank fraud, wrote this letter to the examiner. And if you could, you could probably read it yourself, but let me read a little bit for you. We were fortunate in having in our midst then two men, W.W. W. Watterson, president, and M.Q. Watterson, cashier of the Inyo County Bank, who had the necessary financial straight strength, ability, and fearlessness to be of untold aid in our distress. And if it had not been for their counsel and leadership, I know our citizens would have all left this valley without means to reestablish themselves elsewhere. I have heard it said by City of Los Angeles sympathizers and thoughtless people here that there would have been no trouble in the Owens Valley if the Watterson brothers had been kept out of the fight. This is a shallow statement, for I believe through my knowledge of the type of people here that there would have been trouble of the darkest and bloodiest kind in the Owens Valley had no leaders, leaders arisen, such as the Watersons, to fight for justice for them. This is the district attorney of Inyo County that wrote this just five months before, and the guy that came to prosecute the brothers here in this new trial that was to come about. Even respected Superior Court Judge William Dahey, down in Independence, he wrote the Watersons and he pledged to loan them money to help cover the losses if it would help him help them in any way. Well, the trial went forward. It had been postponed a couple of times. Um, the the, the, selecting the jury was kind of uh, suspect because needless to say, everybody in the county knew the Watterson brothers. A sizable number of people had money in their banks at the time of the collapse. Even Judge Day, he had money in their banks and he had to disqualify himself from presiding over the case just because of that. They called in a Superior Court judge from Kern County as well. So I, I, I like this because those of you that know me a little bit know that I have a very large interest in the history of Death Valley as well. And of course, this little bit of history ties into that as well. When you look at the jury list that was chosen of, for the jury here in Inyo County, if you look at it, two were from Ballarat, which is way over in the Panamint Valley on the east west slope of the Panamint Mountains. One was from Olancha, about 15 miles south of Lone Pine. One was from Deep Springs, about 35 miles east of Big Pine there, out of the Inyo County area, or immediate Owens Valley area. One was from Death Valley, and one was from Lone Pine, the rest being from Bishop and Big Pine. So they had quite a selection of people that they called upon, probably as the district attorney and the uh, uh, defense attorney would excuse people that they found that they hoped would be uh, fair and honest in their uh, d d uh, executing their judicial duties. And uh, in addition to the one guy from Death Valley, one of the alternates, they had two of them, one of the alternates was also from Death Valley. And it's kind of interesting to note that the two people were the superintendent and the assistant superintendent of, of the Borax Company's big mining operation there in Ryan. I just have to laugh a little bit. Gosh, two of the most important people in running the Borax Company were not there for 
a couple of weeks there in November as they sat in on the on the Watersons trial. So Mark and Wolf, Wilfred, as I said, they faced 36 counts, 34 of grand larceny embezzlement and two for grand theft. The trial was postponed a couple of times, but it finally got underway in November 1st of 1927. And needless to say, newspaper columnists from all over California and even a few national ones showed up in Independence to report on the trial. So the trial lasted eight days. Reams of documents, bank, bank financial statements were introduced as evidence to support the charges brought by Hessian and the state banking examiners. Both Watersons, they took the stand at the end of the trial. And again, they did not once deny having taken the money, but they attempted to justify what they had done again because of the wrongdoings by the city of Los Angeles. The Kern County judge though declared their testimony could not be considered as evidence telling as evidence telling the jury, I'm not trying a war between Los Angeles and Inyo County here. So the trial went to the final closing statements and you can't invent this kind of drama. This is Perry Mason and then some at its very best. This is a story that actually appeared in the anti Inyo County LA Times. It's by uh, uh, Chester Hansen, one of their columnists. And may God give you strength to perform your duty, painful though it may be, District Attorney Jess Hessian told the jury in his closing arguments, as tears coursed down the youthful cheeks of the prosecuting prosecutor and Watterson friend as he murmured this prayer. The newspaper column continued, seldom it seems, has any courtroom seen such drama, such pathos and tragedy as was witnessed in this little town today? During the presentation of the stirring closing arguments, Hessian wept. Strong women and men sitting in the courtroom and jury shed many a sincere tear. Even the judge on the bench whipped out his handkerchief and wiped his nose valiantly several times. Well, it took the jury, I'm sorry, it, it took the jury a little more than six hours to deliberate the case. After the verdict was read, some in the court came forward to Mark and Wilfred to express their sorrow. Others, not knowing what to say or think, they sobbed openly in their seats. The brothers were escorted from the courts, but they were allowed to return to their home in Bishop that one night to tie up a few of their final affairs before they were headed off. And the next morning, the sheriff himself of Inyo County escorted the Watterson brothers to San Quentin prison there in Marin County. So they were sentenced to multiple 10 year sentences, but the judge said that they could be served concurrently, but they were convicted on all 30 six counts. They didn't appeal. Again, they didn't ever deny what they had done. They just tried to use the argument. They only did what they did with the very best of intentions. But, you know, in those days, there was no federal deposit insurance company to guarantee people's savings. As, without that, as businesses immediately started to collapse, and people started losing what little bit they had left. People started piling their belongings on their cars and they started to head out of the Owens Valley. A resistance to the LA Aqueduct and its purchase of Northern Owens Valley lands, it literally ground to a halt without the leadership of the Watterson brothers. One Owens Valley resident quoted, our inheritance is turned to strangers. It is not the loss of our homes or the garden, or the growing business, which has been the test. It's the loss of the years, the hope, the struggle, and the endeavor. As I said, resistance to LA ceased without the Watersons' leadership. Los Angeles won a greater victory than it had expected. With the Owens Valley residents in despair, the city and its water department knew this would be an opportune time to repurchase the remaining land in the valley. Citizens in the valleys were desperate for money and many 
Their land was their last possession of real value. And by 1929, Los Angeles was proposing a large one-time block sale for the remaining land in Inyo County. And after several valuations and haggling and negotiations between the Inyo County committee that was put together then and Los Angeles, both sides settled on a sale of 867 businesses and a sale and a, I'm sorry, of business and residential properties for a total of $5.6 million. And with this sale, Los Angeles controlled nearly every valuable slice of the Owens Valley. A few years later, by 1933, the city had purchased 85% of the valley's residential and commercial properties and 95% of the valley's farm and ranch land that was still left. Numerous people wrote letters to the parole board there at San Quentin urging an early release to the Watersons. C.E. Koontz, who was indeed indirectly, well, directly related to the Watterson brothers, he had been an editor of one of the newspapers and, and married to one of their sisters and had moved on, but he wrote a letter on their behalf. He had become uh, one of the board members on the Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Cornelius Vanderbilt, who had owned a newspaper in Reno, he wrote a letter to the parole board urging their fine character and early release. Father John Crowley, who was not living in the Owens Valley at the time of their conviction, he had gone to, been relocated to Fresno. He came back about 1933. But in 1931, he wrote a letter to the parole board attesting to the fine moral character of the two Watterson brothers and that they should be considered for early release as well. Mary Austin, who hadn't lived in the Owens Valley since about 1904, also wrote several letters both from New York and later from Santa Fe, where she lived, urging that kindness and forgiveness be given to the Watterson brothers and perhaps give them an early release as well. This ties a little bit as the pro things progress to our Mono Basin area and its history out there as well. Fred Eaton, the mayor of, former mayor of Los Angeles, who I mentioned earlier, who had long planned to sell his Long Valley Ranch over to the city of Los Angeles and make his retirement income, and had been stymied for so many years. Well, his son, Harold, had mortgaged the, the uh, Long Valley Ranch to the Watterson Bank in loans totaling about $320,000. And when the Watterson Banks failed, the ranch went into receivership and the city purchased it for far less than the $1 million that Eaton wanted and even far less than the half a million dollars that uh, Mulholland had offered just a few years before as well. So Eaton made pennies literally on his purchase compared to what he had hoped to have made one day. And of course, once the city had purchased Long Valley and knew they could build a bigger reservoir and get every bit of water that they possibly could from the Mammoth area and the Rush Creek area and the Mono Basin area, uh, purchases and uh, water right acquisition started to happen uh, farther north in the wonderful Mono Basin area as well and providing water for LA's thirsty straw. So the boys, they continued to serve their time. By all accounts, they were considered to be oh, rather model prisoners in their time there at San Quentin. Finally, in April of 1933, after they served about six years of their 10-year sentence, they were finally paroled. It's interesting to see here, the paper on the left is an Inyo County paper. The, Inyo, the paper on the right is from Los Angeles. The one on the right says, the State Board of Prison Terms and Paroles has again showed its kind-heartedness in paroling the boys. Uh, the LA paper says, another flagrant abuse of the present prison parole system in California is seen in the liberation of the Watterson brother Inyo County bankers after they had served little more than half of their sentence time. Well, the brothers were only released for about a month 
when they had bought an advertisement to appear in the local Owens Valley newspapers. This appeared in April of 1933. And it says, we are desirous of keeping in close contact with all our creditors and bank depositors and those who had monies involved in our affairs in any way. We are going to make an effort to, in some way, ultimate pay, ultimately pay these obligations. And we wish to have an exact record of all our debts so that if we are successful in rehabilitating ourselves financially, we will know to whom we are indebted. So they at least gave words to the fact that they had every intention on paying their debt back. Their son, Paul, or Wilfred's son, Paul, uh, during the whole time they were in prison, also had been telling everybody that he could in the Owens Valley that his father and uncle had every intention of trying to pay everyone back. Well, that, of course, never happened. They weren't ever able to get themselves on their feet financially again. The gargantuan pecuniary losses incurred by the actions of Wilfred and Mark Watterson, they could never be repaid. And at the same time, the mind-numbing effects of water policies implemented by civic organizations from the South upon the Owens Valley and the Eastern Sierras, well, they would be felt and endured by generations to become. Apoliptic dust storms, wells that ran dry, irrigation that had no water to run in them, and ancient lakes either disappearing or nearly turning into an incredible environmental catastrophe. That was the legacy that the Eastern Sierras has been left with. So good intentions, they often lead to unintended consequences. People will most often judge others by their actions and we'll judge ourselves by our own intentions. No one will ever know with any clear certainty what motives lay in the hearts and minds of Mark and Wilfred Watterson. Were they indeed risking everything and trying to prop up some of the few remaining businesses that were still operating in the Eastern Sierras to act as a counterbalance against the city of LA and its devastating water policies? Or were Mark and Wilfred taking advantage of the goodwill and trust of their friends and neighbors to benefit themselves and line their own pockets? Undeniably, they did much good for their friends and neighbors in the Eastern Sierras for over 25 years. And they led a resistance that had, had they been successful, who knows? Maybe it would have resulted in a very different outcome in the Eastern Sierra than we see and endure today regarding the use and ownership of water. But their actions undoubtedly brought much harm to many people, unintended or otherwise. Eastern Sierra villains or victims. It's very hard to say, and probably something we feel we can never know with any kind of certainty. I'm sorry, I fell way behind. I'm going back, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's no way to end the program, sorry. So with that, I wanna close by recalling the words of French activist and philosopher Voltaire. Doubt, it's not a pleasant condition, but certainty, well, it's absurd. We'll never know for sure what were the motives behind the Mark and Watterson brothers and their attempts to keep the city of Los Angeles and its water grabbing policies at bay. So a little more advertisement. If you enjoy Eastern Sierra history, I wanna tell you we have a very active Facebook page. We usually post on it twice a week. It's called the same name as our book, Tales Along El Camino Sierra. We put little history snippets and lots of great photographs on there of Eastern Sierra history. We have an Instagram account that's not quite as active and we have a YouTube account out there as well. And as Robin mentioned earlier, our books are available at the Mono Basin History Museum's online store. You can go on there if you don't have them already and order these books of Eastern Sierra history that we put together. And they also have a story on the Watterson brothers there as well.
So thank you all very much for being attending tonight, listening to our program. We certainly hope you enjoyed it. And again, thank you for your support of Eastern Sierra history and all these wonderful historical societies and museums that help keep it relevant. David, thank you so much. This was really uh, quite the story. We've got a lot of, um, of uh, comments in the chat about what a great story it is and the, the amount of research that you must do. Uh, we've got one question. Did the brothers stay in the Owens Valley? They both went to Glendale at first, where they, where they, were, they had some of their uh, children living. Wilfred returned and would spend most of the better weather season in Long Valley. Uh, his son owned a uh, property near Hilton Creek uh, uh, Resort up there. So Wilfred would spend a lot of time in the, in the Eastern Sierra, not in the Owens Valley so much anymore. Mark stayed pretty much in the Glendale area with just occasional returns. There's a great story in, uh, one of the newspaper articles I wrote, you know, after a couple of years and people lost their money and things got a chance to settle down, they weren't near as popular as they were when they went into prison with those that left behind and lost their savings, their land, and lots of other things. There was a, a so many people had moved from Southern California, from Owens Valley to the Southern California, there was a bit of a reunion that was held every year at a park in Glendale. And the story goes, that there was probably a hundred expatriates from the Owens Valley that were having the picnic. And Wilfred and Mark decided that they would go to the picnic uninvited. And once they got out of their cars and everybody looked their way, the story goes that most of the people turned their backs on them to ignore them. But Mrs. Shaw, another one of the pioneer families who lost a large amount of money, uh, got up, walked over, took them by their hand and escorted to the table and urged others to welcome them as well and remember all the good things of their past in the Owens Valley. Wow, that's a neat story. Um, how did the, do you know how the Watterson Summit got named? Um, so, no, H help me remember where that is. Let's see who asked because I don't know where it is. Um, Janet Carl asked. So Dave, can you say where it is? Janet should be here. Says, <laughs> um, isn't it um, on uh, Benton Crossing Road? There's a Waterson uh, Pass. On the Benton Crossing Road? Oh, well, I, I, that's the high spot there as you cross over from the Long Valley to the other side. I. I don't know the answer to that, how it got, how that got its name. I, I don't know, Janet. That, that, there you go. That's another challenge, David, for that research. Is, that sounds like some good research that should be done. <laughs> I, I'll report back if I can find an answer. Okay. And we've got lots of comments uh, that uh, how much people enjoyed your presentation, David. Um, I like one of them from Carol Holt says, outstanding program really enjoyed the pictures and narration. History can indeed be stranger than fiction. I sure think that is the case here with this. It's one of the things I found interesting. We tried to do a lot of research with this and there aren't very many photographs available of Mark and Wilfred. And you'd think, my goodness, these were two of the most prominent citizens around. Where are the photographs of the brothers? And we can only speculate because we certainly saw no clear evidence of it, but did people get rid of their papers and, and photographs? Did the newspapers you know, want to become, create them persona non grata? And just these people are bad history, get rid of it. it. I just find it very interesting. There's a lot of photographs of people in the Eastern Sierras, but not very many of Wilfred and, and Mark Watterson. Lots of newspaper articles and lots of documents, but not a lot of photographs. It's just amazing. What, what an unbelievable story. Just, it's great. Well, thank you again so very much. And um, the time and research that you put in, we really, really appreciate.
Well, not, uh, not to sound see. trite, but it was our pleasure, Robin, both to do oh, the research you. and to be able to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you much. so much. There's, um, we've got another comment from Connie Millar, and she said in it, so this might go for your next uh, bit of research. In addition to Watterson Pass on the Benton Crossing Road, there is Wilfred Canyon in Long Valley under Glass Mountain. Wonder why that is named for him. Those are very interesting points to bring up. And again, um, so Janet, I'll get back to you personally. If the other person wants to send me an email, um, they can. It, it's it's uh, El Camino Sierra 395 at gmail.com. And if we find out the answer, we'll certainly make a post on our Facebook page about it also. That, that's very interesting. You've really piqued my interest in these two things. That's awesome. Well, before we go tonight, I wanted to, um, to remind everyone of next month's program. And let's see, got to see what date we're looking at. Is uh, June 7th is the first Monday in June. And our own Rich Foy is going to be the presenter. And the title is Hollywood Comes to the Loop. So it's uh, the June Lake Loop. And uh, we're all looking forward to that one. And I thank everyone for their time tonight, especially David. This was just absolutely wonderful. And we greatly appreciate your time. And we hope everyone enjoyed. And if you're not a member, please feel free to join. Thank you so much and have a good evening.